Okay, uh, good morning everyone. First of all, I want to thank Shan for stepping in last week. You know, substituting right in the middle of a class that someone else has prepared can be quite difficult, and I think you did a nice job. So thank you, Shan, for that willingness, brother. I appreciate you uh, doing that for me. Let's recap just a little bit of what was discussed last week because that flows directly into the material that we have for, for this week. So I think last week you got through chapter 3, verse 22, and there was a lot of good discussion around the peace of Christ and the message of Christ dwelling richly in us as we teach and admonish one another. There was some discussion around the difference between psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit as part of that encouragement and admonishment. And there were some comments, too, about the, the submission model. Uh, around the middle uh, and towards the end of, of chapter 3. And because the passage this week is connected to that, I do want to go back and touch on a few other points around, around that passage, just because it helps as a scene set for today's discussion. When it comes to submission, I think many of us are familiar that this is, you know, one way to basis is in Ephesians 5.21 which talks about how everyone submits and, you know, literally means lines up under, means a God-ordered organization. And that everyone submits one way or another. And even Christ, who submitted up to the point of, of death and taking on all of our sin, is the, the ultimate act, the ultimate model of, of submission. And in fact, if you go back to that passage in, in Ephesians 5, you know, we're told to submit not because someone's better than us, told to submit out of reverence for Christ. It's not about us. It's not about the people we're submitting to. It's about submission as reverence for Christ. It's part of the model of, of Christian living. And in Colossians 3.17, we see Paul tell the Colossians, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do it all in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And the whatever you do in that passage then is directly followed by examples from the Christian home. And the Christian home being a very special field for the practice of all the holy principles that, that Paul is instructing the Colossians through. And, and all the principles that he has stated in the preceding verses. And there are a couple of, of points in that submission model. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but there are just a couple of points, again, that have relevance to the discussion today I want to make sure we hit on. The, the, the discussion, and sorry, this is all intro to today's material. I've got to, got to go back through a few points. In that wives submit to husbands piece, the word that's used there, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. You can look it up yourself if, if you want to see the Greek. But it literally means under God's arrangement. And the context is, is not as a vassal submitting to a master. Think of it more like a partner in the model of creation. And what's really interesting is a, when it talks about children submitting to parents, it's a different word. It's not the same word. It's not the same meaning. When it talks about children, it's more like submission to a lawful commander. It's a different relationship. And there is a whole lot I would like to say about that. I'd like to, well... There's a whole lot I like to say, and we don't have time for it, and this is not a class about parenting. But if what I've just said, if you're a parent, a grandparent, or a child, and if what I've just said is new to you, I think you need some, some I think you could really benefit from some personal study on, on that. So this week we're going to pick up back on verse 23, and we're going to try to get through, I think, uh, chapter 4, verse 6 today. So in verse 23, Paul tells us, whatever you do, and remember, this comes right after verse 22, which is the slave submit to master's peace, right? It's, it's part of that submission model. It's talked about wives and husbands, fathers and children, masters and, and slaves. And now he follows on with this. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs. And there is no favoritism. And in verse 1 of chapter 4, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. 
the whatever you do phrase. It's the same phrase that I just read or, or, or reminded you about in Colossians 3 verse 17. And when he says working for the Lord, that is quite a literal phrase. There's nothing clever in it. You, you, you read it and it means exactly what it says, even translated across 2,000 years. It's not working for men, but it's fulfilling a place that one has been given by the Lord. Commentaries generally agree that this pertains to servants, but all believers also have the same calling. Again, in, in chapter 3, verse 17, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That feels to me like a pretty comprehensive, pretty complete statement. I don't really see a lot of room to poke holes in, in that verse. What's interesting here in, in verse 23 and 24 for Colossians is that I would call verse 24 kind of that eternal perspective for, for servants. And I think this probably in, in that time, and remember that that time was different than today, right? It's a completely different culture. And even when we say servants and slaves today, it means something very different than it meant back for the Colossians under the Roman Empire. And I'm, I'm not going to go into a sociological discourse on the differences. Just know you can't compare the two directly. There's a, there are a lot of differences. But 24, I think, is that eternal perspective for, for servants. And it would have been really, really powerful as a comment because at that time, vassals, servants, slaves, you can have whichever word you want to use, they would not normally be able to inherit from their masters, from the people that they served. Now, I don't know if anyone has studied that sociology or that culture and maybe has a different comment or can educate us, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that what I said is, is correct. But what Paul is reminding here for the believers is that dwelling in Christ, whether you are servant or master, you will receive the same inheritance, right? The servants will, the slaves will receive the same inheritance, the same assurance of salvation as the non-slaves. We are all equal under Christ. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And that phrase, since you know, it has a certainty to it. There's an assurance there. Right? It's the certainty of the gospel, the assurance of our salvation through obedience of, of that gospel. And when I was refreshing my, my, uh, my lesson this week, I just paused and I, I had to chastise myself a little bit because it's been a while since I've just stopped and just marveled at that phrase, the assurance of salvation. The last couple of weeks I've been traveling and, and some other stuff's been going on and, and I had to remind myself Y'all, don't forget, no matter what else is going on in our life, that assurance of salvation, it's a miracle. It is awesome. And it's bigger than anything else. The good stuff or the bad stuff, it's bigger than anything else going on in our lives. So I kind of had to, I was kind of reminded of that again this week, and I wanted to offer that as an encouragement to, to you and your families. to Don't forget how amazing our salvation is and the confidence and the assurance and that peace that we have we have in Christ. And I think that's what Paul is trying to share with the church in Colossae. Right? He's trying and, and especially in this context of slaves and masters, he's reminding them that you have this assurance. And it's bigger than your role on earth. And I wanted to bring that up because when we're ministering or evangelizing to people. That can be a great discussion topic. When people ask me at work, Michael, how are you doing? I don't say fine. I'll say, well, everything that matters in eternity is going awesome. Every now, every single time, they'll look at me kind of weird because they're expecting fine and move on. It's supposed to be a hallway courtesy. It's not really a conversation. And when I mention something like that, anyway, it... Um, it can, be, it can be a seed, perhaps. Verse 25. Anyone who does wrong will be paid, repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. So, again, we're all equal in God's sight, whether we're slave or free, regardless of our role, regardless of what we're doing, regardless of our position, we're all equal in God's sight. And I think this was specifically this verse, again, in the context of that letter to that church at that time and in the context of the preceding verses, 
I think it, this was written both as an encouragement to slaves and a warning to their masters. Because he then follows in chapter 4, verse 1, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. I have no clue why the translators of the original letter put this verse as a chapter break. It, it makes no sense to me. So I'm going to teach it like it's just a continuation and we'll get into the what I think is actually chapter 4 later. Anyway, it's, it says, because you know you also have a master in heaven. The apostle then, you know, he proceeds with the duty of masters to the servants. It's a balanced discussion. Again, there's no favoritism under the gospel. And Paul is using this very unbalanced earthly relationship to point out how there is balance in our heavenly relationship. We're all on the same level. And when he talks to the masters, he said, not only is justice required of them, but strict equity and kindness Right? There's balance in this earthly relationship. He's reminding them to deal with their servants as they would expect God to deal with themselves. So if you pick that apart a little bit, provide here, it means, a, it means deliberate care. It means conscious, willful, purposeful care. It's not something that happens by accident or by happenstance. It happens because the masters had to put in time, money, and energy to care. The provision would include food, it would include wages, an appropriate type of work, an appropriate quantity of work, etc. In the Greek, if you take that phrase right and fair, it really means just and equal, and the focus is really on justice. At the same time, the idea running through this passage, it's of a, it's, think of it like a common fellow service to Christ of all alike, and in Colossians 3.11, remember, we're reminded that in Christ Jesus, there is neither bond nor free. So there's this continuous message of we're all the same through the lens of, lens of Christ. And that our earthly behavior should reflect that. So, so the question was, hey, I, I, sometimes I struggle with the phrase which is thrown out, and I don't answer, but I'm assuming it's from a child. Um, how, do I, how do I handle the phrase that that's not, that's not fair? And he just wanted my opinion. So I'm going to give you my opinion. Um, fairness and justice, I could argue, are two different things. I think of justice as a condition under the law. There's an action and there's a lawful reaction and a consequence if that action and reaction are not on the same level. Fairness, I kind of think of something as a reward or an outcome based on my effort. If I put in X amount of effort, what's fair is X amount of reward. But I'm, I'm also mindful, if you remember the comment I made maybe in, in week one or week two, and we had a really good discussion, and, and some of the class responses really, really provoked my thinking. My kids lots of times heard the phrase, well, yeah, I, you know, that may not be fair, but you know, neither is the gospel. Because I don't deserve it, you don't deserve it, blah, 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 blah. Well, of course, there was the rebuttal that, yeah, it is fair because everybody, everybody has it. So I, I think, um, in, in short, my, my opinion is that dealing with that aspect of fairness, I wouldn't address the question directly. I would keep digging to find out what the real issue is. That, that sounds like a, I, I call it a throw out phrase. You know, I'm frustrated, I can't win the argument, so I'm gonna throw out this bumper sticker phrase. That's not fair. Anyway, there's probably a whole lot more discussion to have there, and I don't know if that was helpful, but that's the problem with opinions, right? We all have, we all have a couple in there, all about the same weight, anyway. So I, I think if we consider, you know, going back to this, this concept that Paul's talking about in, the, in these verses, and in, in Christ Jesus there's neither bond nor free, I think Paul wanted to remind his readers that, you know, at some point 
we are literally all equal before, before Christ. And it feels to me a little bit like a golden rule for masters and slaves. I, I don't know if that's correct, but that was kind of, that's just kind of how I read it. And there's one other really interesting historical fact here that I think colors or, or, or colors in the lines around some of the, the context here. At the time this letter was written, in the Roman Empire, slaves probably made up the majority of the population. So Christianity was very likely viewed with suspicion because it was trying to upset or reorder society. And so when we read these letters, remember, you can't read all of this context through modern America in 2023. You, you have to go back and, and think through where was Paul, what was his condition, where was the church at Colossae, what was their condition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so... Now we can talk about the chapter 4 general outline. We've already covered verse 1. I think it goes with chapter 3. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear your question. Could you repeat it? So the question, verse 25, is around, um, you know, 25 says, hey, look, you're going to be paid wrong for, for what you've done, and how does that balance with the idea of Christ taking, taking away your sins? Um, you've stumped me. I have not thought of that verse in, in that way. I'm going to pause and see if anyone else has a reaction to that. You know, I'm not going to plant it and plan that whole discussion, but it sure looks like we did. If any of you believe that, I'm going to go ahead and take the credit, but no, that was, that was pure accident. For those of you who didn't hear, Sean said, um, my sermon talks about that later this morning, so I'm going to defer to that, if, if, if that's okay. Travis, your comments does, does make me think of a, a conversation I've had many times where, you know, forgiveness doesn't necessarily relieve you of consequences. Um, anyway, that, that's part of what some of that comment was about. Brother? So, so the comment was, and, and, and Dave, I love your humility, he led with perhaps. He said perhaps the, in the context of that verse, the instruction there is around, you know, servants don't just obey your masters when your masters are watching, but obey them all the time. So it, it's a humility and a fulfillment of service out of reverence for Christ more than just, oh, I'm being watched, I'm only going to do what's right when I'm, when I'm being, wrong, being watched. So yeah, that could very well, that could very well be part of that. It goes back to your fairness question. Yeah, so the comment was around, um, 
well, you know, this person isn't doing it. Why am I having to do it? Why, you know, they're, they're misbehaving, you're not getting punished. Why do I have to behave correctly? That's not, that's not fair. And, and it makes me think back to any time we fall into that relativistic view, I think, where does that put the focus? It puts the focus right on us. It becomes the me show. And I can't find a single time in scripture where the me show is rewarded, right? Usually it's a trick of the adversary. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the following verses around the role of thankfulness and prayer and how it keeps your focus outward instead of inward. And I, th- I think those conversations overlap. Not, not completely, but they overlap just a little bit. Comment in the back. Yeah, so, so the, the comment was, a, was kind of going back to the fairness question around accountability and, again, a reference back to that submission model. So, you know, everybody is submitting. And, and I think kind of the inference is we're all to submit out of reverence for Christ. And so, yeah, if you look at just me and just this person next to me, it may not seem fair. But if you look at the whole model, especially overlaying the sacrifice that Christ made for us, then that, I think that fairness question settles itself. One other comment? Yeah, so the, the comment was specifically around the role of women in the home and the submission to husbands and how that can be difficult. And that if I remember this overall model, that somehow makes it, makes it better. So let me take a poll real quick. And this is, I'm going to ask everyone to participate. I know, we hate that, but everyone's going to have to participate. Raise your hand if you like submitting. There's one joker in the back. I said, raise your hand if you like submitting. <laughs> so, we're going to submit to Christ, and there's absolute freedom in that. So submitting uh, can, can benefit us with, uh, with uh, a great level of freedom. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the, the comment is that there's, there's great freedom in that submission to Christ. And, and I, I, I didn't ask if it benefits us. I asked if we like it. It's a it, it is a journey. And y'all, l- let, me, let me just time out here. I could teach a whole quarter on the submission model. And there's some awesome parallels. And if you're going to talk about the submission model, you have to read it in Ephesians and you have to read it in Colossians. And you have to read it with the overlay of the gospel as the main, the main theme. There's lots in there that's difficult. There's lots in there that is wonderful. And I would love to talk more about it, but I'm going to be selfish now and get back to my outline because I do need to run through the... Okay, I'll give you, I'll give you the last word. Okay. okay. <laughs>
sows. Right. So the very provocative question is, okay, in verse 25, when it talks about anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs and there is no favoritism. Up until that point, Paul has been talking to believers. And in verse 25, does he switch horses now and start talking to unbelievers? I don't know. I think, not having considered that particular question deeply, I can provide you my reaction. On, I can't provide you a studied opinion. I think he is still talking to believers. I think he is talking about the physical, earthly consequences of behaving in a way not consistent with Christian living. And I am 99% sure that he doesn't say you won't be forgiven. But he does say, I think, there will be earthly consequences. It reminds me back to a conversation I had with a colleague a few years ago. And this person, I love him to death. He's not a believer yet. And he subscribes to this feeling of, oh, well, everything happens for a reason. And that was kind of in a context of he'd recently divorced and he was maybe in love with this other girl and he was asking my advice. And so, you know, I was trying to provide a biblical perspective. And he kind of didn't like it. And he retreated back to, oh, well, everything happens for a reason. And this is a little bit indelicate example, so forgive me for that. And we were in a restaurant, we were in a, a foreign city, and unbeknownst to us, there was a certain level of clientele there that had a certain profession that's not consistent with, with Christian living. And I told this gentleman, I said, well, let me, you know, let me, let me test that with you real quick. You think everything happens for a reason. If you decide to pay this woman to sleep with you tonight, and you get an STD. Did that happen for a reason? Or did that happen because you made bad choices? Did that happen because there are earthly consequences to your decisions? And he really didn't like that. But it totally just popped the bubble of that phrase. That, you know, and you hear that on TV and stuff all the time. And I just hate that phrase because I don't believe it. I said, you know, everything happens because God wills it. Or he allows it. It's, you know, anyway. So I think I answered your question, and you're kind of nodding your head this way, which helps me give confidence I'm not totally off base. So. I second that motion. Right. Yeah, I, I think it does fit within within that context. Yeah, so Sean's comment was that he thinks, and I think he's right, 25 is both the conclusion to 22, 23, 24, but also a transition to the next verse, chapter 4, verse 1. So speaking of chapter 4, I've gone all the way back. Uh, give me a second. Here. There we go. So chapter 4 outlines pretty, pretty quick. We've kind of covered the first verse. The rest of the class today, if I can get to it, will be uh, verses 2 through 6, which are really exhortations to live a godly life. And then next week, we'll conclude with the final instructions and greetings and then kind of a, a, a quarterly wrap-up. So in chapter 4, he continues, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in change. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Some consider this a continuation from chapter 3, verse 17. Um, I personally don't agree with that. I think it is in the sequence that it's intended, and I think you could follow that sequence literally. But either way, it doesn't change the spiritual significance. Um, devotion here is really continue steadfastly, is what Paul means there. 
And the point he's making is that devotion and prayer is necessary to perform all the duties he just described. Devotion and prayer is a necessary ingredient to perform all those, all those duties. Prayer needs to be frequent and constant. And I, I think, you know, it goes back to verse 22. It could go back to verse 17. It could go back maybe to the whole, to the whole letter. Because when you think about the challenges that Paul and the encouragements, the commands that he's been giving us and, and the church at Colossae at the time, setting our minds and hearts on things above, putting to death our earthly desires, clothing ourselves with compassion, bearing with one another in love. I'm not big enough to do that without devoted prayer. And I think Paul is suggesting that most, if not all of us, are, are the same, that we need that devotion of, of prayer. And I love the elegance here because it's one of a a countless number of examples where God's word gives both the command and the solution all in one passage. I just just think it's elegant and and beautiful. And remember that frequent prayer, when we have a, uh, when we continue steadfastly in our prayer, continue means continuous all the time, steadfastly means with intent and with, with strength. That kind of frequent prayer is going to keep us familiar with God. It's going to keep our focus on things above, which we're called to do early in the chapter, and it's going to keep us out of, out of temptation. It also says, with thanksgiving. Uh, sorry, I skipped a bit about watchful. I, I wanted to, to key on that because when it says, be watchful in prayer, it means attention and intention. So our prayers, we should have attention and intention in our prayers. And when we're thankful, you know, that's very often connected with prayer and it's an essential element. And I have a whole bunch of points around the role of thankfulness in prayer. We don't have time for it today. I've given a few, a few references. Um, and I think for the sake of time, I'm going to skip reading some of those verses and just remind us how often thankfulness and prayer are used together. I think there's a really important lesson there. And then if you are struggling to be thankful in your life, one way to reclaim that is to stop focusing on the things you don't have, which is a tool of the adversary, and focus on the things you do have. And I would refer you to that last reference verse in Matthew, where God talks about, don't worry about what you'll eat or drink, look at the birds of the air, they're fine. And it ends with, are you not much more valuable than they? And a reminder that no matter what you're worried about or what you do or don't have in your life, we have a God who created us, who loves us, and who wants us to spend eternity with him. I'm going to skip this slide for time, but just know that thankfulness or prayer without thankfulness you're going to be really challenged to have that familiarity with God and to really have that heavenly-minded attitude and, and keeping your heart set on things above. In verse 3, Paul asks to pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in change. Um, I misspelled mystery on the bottom there, ignore that. It, it's supposed to be mystery with a Y. But this is part of, you know, part of this intentive, deliberate prayer, right? The prayer with intention and prayer with attention. Paul's asking them to remember him and his mission, which is to preach. And I think what's remarkable here is this guy's in prison, and he's not asking to be freed from prison. He's asking to be free to pursue his mission. I think that's incredibly humble and very, very admirable. He also asks that, they pray he may proclaim it clearly as I should. And remember, he's in Rome. He's basically alone. He has some helpers. He was surrounded by multitudes of the wicked. He was exposed and threatened to death. Yet he, his desire was to boldly speak in the name of the Lord Jesus and invite sinners to repentance. He wanted to use that open door. So he's all about his mission. He's all about the preaching and that evangelizing. I want to spend the last few minutes talking about some of the most challenging verses for me in the entire book of Colossians. This is 5 and 6 in chapter 4. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And apologies, the picture kind of covered the text there. 
And it makes me wonder if this is a reminder to Paul himself as much as it is to the church at Colossae. Remember, he's wrongly imprisoned. He has as much reason to be bitter and outraged as anyone. And yet, his heart is full of love for sinners, full of desire to fulfill the mission he's been, been given in God. I think it's a great lesson for America today if, if, you know, if you are online at all or read the news, what do you constantly see? You see this outrage, this outrage over everything is an outrage. I had to wait in line at the grocery store. I'm outraged. I mean, okay, there are a few things that probably deserve that energy, but most everything I see, it's, it, it, really, it really doesn't. It, we've lost perspective, and I think Paul is reminding us about, about that perspective and it's incredibly relevant today that we should be firm in our defense of God's word, but do so in a way that leads others to Christ. And that is so hard sometimes. And that's why this verse is so challenging. When, when he says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, make the most of every opportunity. Be wise there, I think, means do nothing that would disgrace the faith in the eyes of the unbelievers or unnecessarily exasperate them against you. And when it says outsiders... Um, some think this phrase is barred from Judaism, which means outside the Jewish congregation. I think in this context, it means non-believers, people that are outside the church. And that's consistent with Colossians 1, 1 verse 10. And so, to me, verse 5 is a huge point. This is a mega point in the, the letter of, to the Colossians. Because today, many, many non-believers judge religion, not faith. And how do they judge religion? They judge it by our speech and our behavior. And we're not judged fairly. It's not fair. Any hint of hypocrisy, any hint that we're actually human and fallible and sinners and sheep, which we all are, any hint of that often is used as an excuse to, to cry hypocrisy and, and decry the entire structure of, of, of faith. Church people are held to a higher standard. But remember, our only value comes from where? Christ. Our only value really comes from the assurance we have in, in salvation. There's no room for hubris in our Christian walk. In fact, one of Sean's recent sermons on the most important things reminds us that Christians, we can make Jesus look bad. And I wrote down a quote from your February sermon. We only reflect the love of Christ when we are engaged in kingdom work. And I think that is exactly what Paul is talking about here. Making the most, that phrase, uh, make the most of every opportunity, really means buying out the opportunity. You're investing, you're buying out that, that opportunity. Embracing and improving every opportunity of doing good, particularly related to gaining souls for Christ. I think that's consistent with all the previous verses around setting our hearts and minds on, on things above. And verse 6 is the most challenging part, part for me. Let your conversations always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Think of this as a gracious, pleasant, and sweet. Not necessarily um, tolerant, and that's a trigger word for some people. Not necessarily you just roll over Right? We need to be firm in our defense of the faith. Right? Take up the shield of faith against the evil one and all the flaming arrows, etc., etc. But you can do that in a way that is gracious and pleasant and, and sweet. In Colossians 3.16, there's a definite article in. It refers to the grace. Well, here in 4.6, it just says, there, it doesn't have that article. Therefore, that's why it means gracious. Right? Let your conversation be gracious. Seasoned with salt makes me think of Mark 9.50. And remember, you know, today in society, what are you trying to do with salt? Have less of it. Well, back then, salt was often a currency. It was highly treasured and highly, highly valuable. Um, in Mark 9.50, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Some think this is a reference to the preserving quality of salt you know, symbolic of preventing corruption or, or rot. Um, some think it, it's, a, it's a, a reference to adding flavor or purpose. But, you know, 
what it means, adding salt or being full of salt, means that you are prepared and you're deliberate. Right? Salt was quite valuable. It was a currency at the time, so it wouldn't be, wouldn't be wasted. And also, kind of a neat literary quirk, back in, in the time, both Greek and later Latin authors, they used that phrase, salt, they use that to express the punginess and wittiness of, of speech. So do with that what you, what you will. And, yeah. Yeah, the, the comment is around the importance of having understanding and the ability to listen when you're having these conversations and you're not rushing, rushing to judgment. That's part of being full of grace or, or gracious. I think the really challenging piece for this, if we, if we bring this context to today, and I think this is one of those verses and concepts that applied exactly as much in Colossae as it does in America in 2023, you have to be full of grace and gracious for the people that are around you, even when you have serious issues, right? Whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, whether you're talking to someone pro-life or pro-choice, and I have a strong opinion on one I think is biblically centered and one is from the devil, but we need to be full of grace and seasoned with salt. Who you did or didn't vote for, you need to be full of grace and seasoned with salt. If you have rebellious children, or if you're the clueless parents, full of grace, seasoned with salt. The gender debate, full of grace, seasoned with salt. Pick any topic. We are to be full of grace and seasoned with salt. And one last really, one last really cool point of context here. Herodotus tells a story of a salt lake in the neighborhood of, of Colossae, which had been identified and which allegedly still supplies the whole surrounding country with salt. So if that's true, it doesn't change the spiritual meaning, it just adds kind of a neat little bit of, of context to this phrase, to the church at that time. So one last comment in the back. <laughs> so the comment is around the balance of salt. If you use too much, it makes the food taste bad and it could be the same way with a conversation so god bless you all and we'll see you next week for our concluding lesson